Cannabis Health Radio. I'm Ian Jessup. And I'm Corey Yelland. Our guest today was diagnosed with cervical cancer at the age of 22, and following surgery, the doctor said it was gone. Then when she was 33, it was back. Joining us to tell her story of how cannabis has helped her is Carly Thiessen of British Columbia. Carly, thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. Now, you first started using cannabis for severe anxiety and depression. How old were you at the time? Well, I was in my early 20s when I started using it as what I would refer to as, as medicine. I started smoking cannabis in high school, but obviously I wasn't smoking, um, you know, the right strain or what I should have been for my condition. And what was your condition? Well, um, I've always been an anxious person and I've always suffered from depression. So I guess in my teenage, in my teenagehood, it would have been for that for um, severe cramps and severe anxiety and depression. Yeah, sometimes the teenage years are tough to get through, aren't they? They are, yeah. And especially since I did have this this condition, um, it made so that my periods when I was growing up, as far as like, you know, moon time and such, they just weren't a fun time for me. Um, I had excruciating periods and excruciating, for about two weeks out of the month, I was just not myself. Now, were you put on any medications? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, several. Um, being a teenager and not knowing exactly what's going on, my mom went to the doctor, and the first thing that my doctor said for me being 15, I asked if I was sexually active and then said, oh, well, even though she's not sexually active, she needs birth control to regulate her periods. Mm-hmm. And, of course, that was that was the beginning of my pharmaceuticals, and pharmaceuticals just never agreed with me. What other pharmaceuticals did they put you on, Carly? Well, because they put you on birth control and then you're in severe pain, they like to add, you know, all the um, opiates and stuff that they can. So I was on Tylenol 3. I was on um, Percocets. Uh, I was on a lot of different things that I never should have been on. Um, Looking back at it now, I don't know what they were thinking putting me on all that medication. Were you on Um, antidepressants as well? I wasn't on antidepressants until I was in my early 20s. And what happened with that was um, I got misdiagnosed as bipolar. I have some family history, and uh, they just automatically put me in that category, even though I didn't have any of the symptoms that necessarily people have with that. When they did diagnose me as bipolar, um, or what they thought to be bipolar, they put me on a whole slew of medications, um, right from lithium, not trying anything else first, let's put her on lithium, mm. and then um, we'll put her on Seroquel and some benzodiazepines and see how that works. What a nice little cocktail. Mm-hmm. So, how so did- what happened, Corey, is I was 150 pounds to begin with. Right. I was so full of anxiety that I was not eating properly. And then after I started taking all those medications, I gained 150 pounds. Wow. And that that must have been horrible, not only physically, but emotionally for you, being a young woman and gaining all that weight. My self-confidence was completely out the door. Yeah, it it was probably like one of the most horrible times for me. But right around that time is when I met Gail Quinn from, from Victoria Canada's Buyers Club. Gail was the one that, she saved my life. She recognized what I was going through. She she saw in my skin that my liver was shutting down. She said that I w- had a couple of months to get off of the pills that I was on or I was going to die. And then I went to my um, I went to my doctor and sort of explained my concerns and of course, you know, I was my concerns weren't legitimate at that time. But then my mom went to my doctor and then shared the concerns and then they finally looked into doing something for me so you're saying which was sorry to interrupt but you're saying when you went to the doctor that he basically dismissed you until your mom went in yes Mm. yeah it it sort of seems like as soon as you're diagnosed with anything mental health wise sort of your credibility goes out the window and i hate to say it but i never would have believed it unless it happened to me and it's definitely true Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm not that surprised actually yeah so being as that was i just I told them that I was no longer going to take the the medicine so they could either help me get off of it safely or they could just let me be. And so they did help me get off of it safely. But it was excruciating hell coming off of it. 
and coming off of it, I needed to use edibles and uh, a lot of cannabis to smoke in order to keep the morning sick or the sickness from, you know, you're just so nauseous coming off of that stuff and your whole body just doesn't know exactly why, why you're not giving it to it anymore, right? So right. Now, did Gail guide you through that process? Gail was the one that she was sort of like my doctor during that period. She would tell me, you know, you need to take these so many edibles a day, try this tincture, do these topicals. And without cannabis, I know I would not have been able to come off of it successfully because I was just so sick. And what cannabis did for me and what it did for later on in my cancer when I had when I was taking the oil as my treatment is it just completely takes away your nausea so that you can actually eat. And for me, that, like, no other medication or anything has been able to do that. Wow. So for listeners' sake who don't know, uh, Gail Quinn was an amazing woman who passed away uh, almost a year ago. Uh, She Mm -hmm. was uh, Ted Smith's partner. Uh, Ted Smith started the very first uh, Cannabis Buyers Club in North America. He's been involved as an activist for 20 20 plus years. And uh, Gail was an absolutely amazing woman who was changed many many people's lives carly when you started to get off the pharmaceuticals did you notice a difference in your weight did your weight start to drop down not at first not until i started taking a tincture on a regular basis um i had high blood pressure i had hypothyroidism all because of this medication and basically i was taking a two to one tincture so two two times cbd to one times thc And what that was doing was it was lowering my blood pressure and it made it so my hyperthyroidism was gone. So um, I didn't have those issues to deal with anymore. And as soon as that stuff sort of started to go away, like as far as the high blood pressure, and of course, you cannot, it's very hard to lose weight when you're hyper or hypo um, with thyroidism. So as soon as that was treated, yes, the weight started coming off like rapidly. And your hyperthyroidism is non-existent now or kept under control? It's non-existent. It does not exist. Wow. That's awesome. Neither does my, neither does my blood pressure. And my whole family has a higher, has problem with high blood pressure. Now, at the age of 22, you were diagnosed with cervical cancer. That must have come as quite a shock to you. Um, it came as a huge shock to me, yeah. I... Um, I was kind of blindsided by by it, really, because they had just told me that I had some irregular cells. So it went from just thinking that I had some irregular cells to being told, well, no, you're going to have to have surgery and more. So what happened next then? What happened with that was I went into the Royal Jubilee Hospital. They sent me to BC Women's in Vancouver. BC Women's then did some tests on me and they found out that, like I said, I did have irregular cells. So they immediately sent me up for surgery. Um, I had just had my first child. I only have one child. He's 18. And um, I, after I had him, they basically said, you're going to have to go in for surgery. So I did the surgery. And after I did the surgery, they said, okay, well, it's all gone. You're fine. Just carry on with your life. So um, I went on my merry way, and then um, about ten years later, um, I went back into the hospital because I was, or to the doctor because I was getting some really excruciating cramps, kind of like period cramps, but not at that time of the month. Right. And they always say with cancer, there's no pain. I'm sorry, but that is so not true. Not in certain situations, anyway. It was very painful. I went in and. I got some tests done, and the doctor came into my room and said that that he had some very bad news for me. And I was just thinking that, like, you know, maybe something with the surgery, they cut off too much, or I don't know, something, right? So um, his face went white, and he he, he said, well, it's back. And I said, well, what's back? He says, your cancer's back. I couldn't figure out what they were talking about, Corey, because I thought, I guess I was just thinking the best of things but i had just completely thought that once they all cut it out it was gone gone and that was it done deal and that was really it right and now knowing what i know obviously we know that that's not what happens but so basically i went to ted and gail and i 
I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I think that, like, you know, I don't know, th- know that I'm going to be able to fight this. And my friend Gail, she's she's one of my best friends. Um, she was treating her breast cancer at the time. And she said, oh, no, it's not taking you. We're going to get through this together. So she got me hooked up with some oil through a lady that I now work for. Um, she's one of the best oil makers in Canada. And uh, I started on my treatment of oil. It cost me $6,000. It's the only reason I'm here today. How much oil was that for $6,000? For me, it was about 85 grams. But also, that's not including suppositories. So uh, the way that I did it was I did the Rick Simpson protocol with the oil, but on top of uh, whatever amount I was taking a day, I was also using cervical uh, suppositories, which we were making. Does it make you high if you do it cervically or vaginally? That was the awesome part about it, actually, was because of I have so much anxiety and so much, um, I'm just such a, a stress case myself. I need to keep busy. Right. So I didn't want to stop working while I was doing this treatment. I needed something to keep me going. So the suppositories during the day, they don't make you high at all. So I was using them during the day. And then I was using my oil, oil at night. So that's how I did it. And how much oil were you taking? At night? Um, well, I just started you off with a rice grain size. And right. then um, when I was up to my gram, I did it for um, a month and a half instead of a month. Carly, um, were you using a high THC oil or a one-to-one? or? For me personally, I was using um, a one-to-one and a high THC. At first, I got some oil that was just sent to me from a friend. So... It was just extremely um, high THC. But then when I went and started getting oil off of the lady that I did the rest of my treatment with, it was a one-to-one. And then the suppositories were just high THC. THC. So I was doing both at the same time. Okay, Carly, did I mishear you? You said you took the oil, all of the oil in a month? No. So what I did was usually what happens is you only do a gram. The Rick Simpson protocol is that you do a gram for one month. Like once you get up to a gram, you do it for you do that gram for a month. But instead of doing it for a month, I did it for a month and a half, which kind of made my treatment a little bit more expensive. Oh, I see. Okay. Now, do you continue to take oil on a daily basis? Yes. Now, after you started taking this cannabis oil, when did the cancer disappear? Well, according to the doctors, it's never really disappeared. It's just not there. <laughs> right. Uh, now, that's about as clear as mud. But anyway, we'll yeah, go with that. Exactly. For sure. Yeah, it's not dete- not detectable, whatever not the heck detectable. that means. So, it means um, they can't find it, but they don't want to say that you um, achieved success. Success. Exactly. Well, what happened, Corey, was the protocol in Canada for when you get cancer as a single parent is that you go into the cancer agency and you either sign up for chemo or radiation. Mm -hmm. And when I said no, they said, okay, well, you're not operating in the best interest of your child, so we're going to take your child. And I said, okay, well, you go ahead and take my child. I said, but I'm signing all my rights over to my mother. Um, And then they decided that they weren't going to take him. Um, because I just, I guess I was just not going to have any of it. And I really would have signed all the rights over to my mom, um, without question, because in my eyes, I knew that that chemo and radiation was going to kill me. I knew it. Um, it, it killed three of my family members right in front of me. Um, even though I gave them oil. So, um, there is such a thing as doing oil too late. And sometimes you just don't get it in time. Time. And that wasn't going to be me. That was not going to be me. I was going to be here for my son and for my family. Carly, you know, I'm I'm sad to tell you that this is a really familiar story, particularly coming out of the States with uh, parents who choose to do uh, oil and Mm -hmm. having their kids apprehended. It's uh, really a sad state of affairs. I don't know why they think that, you know, on the worst time of your life, it's okay for them to sort of take all that matters to you. Mm -hmm. That's sort of why I'm confused, because even with chemo or radiation, those people are are probably going to die anyway. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, And, you know, the other thing, Corey, is that they do know that cannabis helps cancer. 
And at least if they're not going to admit that it cures it, then they know that it helps it. Oh, absolutely. Carly, did your son know you had cancer? I had to sit down with my son three years ago and tell him that there was a chance that I wasn't going to be here anymore. Um, and I had to sort of set up, you know, he's he's almost 18 now, but I sort of had to set up stuff with family that I hadn't talked to in years and years and wasn't necessarily comfortable with talking to, but needed to do it in order to make sure that my son had people that he could rely on in the future. Boy, how did he react to it? He is the strong, silent type. He doesn't really, really say much, um, but I know, like, everything changed after I, after I told him that. His whole, just our whole relationship changed. It just went from me being, you know, me being the primary caregiver to my son just always worried about me. Must have made you feel good, though. It made me feel good, but it, it also made me feel like, you know, there's so many kids out here that are going through the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And instead of making them feel like there's not really an end in sight as far as their can- their parents' cancer going away, I think that we could sort of educate these, these children. I mean, I'm not talking about um, elementary age children. I'm talking about high school kids and, you know, educate them on how to sort of um, – be instrumental in their in their parents' recovery because I'm telling you, if you choose cannabis, it's not about it's a death sentence. It's about you're gonna you're gonna recover. You know, you can live, and uh, a lot of people don't have that opportunity otherwise. Chemo's not going to do that for you. I mean, sure, it does it for some for some things, but when you have a, a tumor the size of a softball in your cervix, it's not really going to do a lot as far as guaranteeing that your future is going to be bright was that how large your tumor was yeah boy that's that's huge and a small wonder that you were getting that pain yeah (laughs) why yeah exactly given the fact that uh, early on in your your life you were diagnosed with you had severe anxiety and depression Mm. how, how did that play into it when you were diagnosed with cancer um well, it's funny because I was always terrified of needles, and when I got diagnosed with cancer, um, you pretty pretty much got to get over your fear because you're getting poked all the time. So, in a lot of ways, it helped me. It helped me with my fear, as far as like um, I had a severe fear of death. I had a severe fear of needles, and I sort of had to face those head on. Um, so, what it it's it sounds really funny, but it, it's actually made it so that I, I'm at peace now. I know that I've done everything that I can do to make my life better and to try to help myself. And now it's just in, you know, God's hands. I'm yeah. not afraid of dying anymore, and I was before. Yeah, if you overcome your your fears, uh, mm-hmm. life becomes much, mm-hmm. much, much less anxious. Yeah, less exactly. stressful. You face death. Uh, tumor in your cervix the size of a softball my god how long before that tumor disappeared well um what happened was it just it, i was getting scans done um how long probably i would say probably four and a half months four and a half months and it was gone yeah well wow. do you remember the day that you had confirmation that it was gone yeah, I phoned Ted, and uh, I just started bawling. Um, I always knew that that it was going to help me, Corey. I always knew that this was the right choice for me. Yeah. But the day that the doctor looked at me and said, "You know, there's nothing that can be detected," and I, of course, I, I was wait. I wanted the answer. Well, it's completely gone, and you'll never get it again. Mm-hmm. But. Um, I just phoned Ted and I phoned my mom and I just, I just sobbed like it. it, There's nothing better than hearing that, you know. I know, (laughs) (laughs) and I know you know. So, um, did the doctor know what you were doing? No. After they threatened to take my son away, and I didn't really tell them anything that I was doing after that. I figured out then that I was labeled anyway as somebody that didn't want to help themselves and. The other thing is, too, is that like I was on disability at that time. I was on 
um, disability through the provincial government, and they were giving me an end of life supplement. So, uh, when you're dying and when you have less than two years to live, the the government gives you this, you know, fifty dollars end of life supplement. And basically, what happened is, two years later, they phoned me and they said, "Well, why are you still alive?" Why are you still getting this? And you're like, excuse me for living. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I was like, like what? <laughs> what do you mean? Why am I still alive? And then that's when I had to sort of tell them that I had used cannabis oil. And, you know, basically they they said, oh, that's nice for you. Oh, that was it? Yeah, that was it. That's nice for you. That's so nice for you, yeah. I'm surprised, Carly, that when the doctor told you uh, he couldn't detect any cancer he didn't ask what you did no they're not really interested in it like i said to, I said to Corey previously they know what cannabis oil does they just don't want to admit it i mean there's there's time after time after time and case after case after case that they just they just won't admit that this is what's working yeah I, mean, I don't know why yeah i don't know why either it's just remarkable that uh, you have a patient in front of you who had a, a huge cervical tumor the tumor is gone. So the obvious question is to ask you, what did you do? <laughs> well, especially since like the reason that I got provincial disability was because of cancer, right? Yeah. So now, of course, you think, you'd think you think that they'd be a little bit more interested because if I did the traditional ca- cancer treatment, they would be paying for my treatment, which is seven to $10,000 a month. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, this person that has cancer, that they've seen their, their paperwork from their doctor confirming that they have cancer, and there's no money being paid for traditional treatment. And that doesn't stick out for them. It's not alarming for them, and I don't understand why. It's, you know, like, I, I just don't understand it. Carly has this, these two bouts of cancer, one when you were 22 and one when you were 33. Has it changed your perspective of life at all? Um, so basically what's happened ever since I took the cannabis oil is now I supply people and help people with the treatment of their cancer and guide them in taking oil and how to take it the best way possible. So since I've been diagnosed and I've been cleared, my grandmother got um, pancreatic cancer and was in hospice. And the only thing that kept her alive for the last week in order for her, all of our family to come from Scotland and say goodbye was suppositories. And I went out there and I drove out there twice a day in order to give her the cannabis suppositories to keep her around so that she could say goodbye. And I know that it makes a difference. And I, I know that, um, I know that it, it, the last weeks of her life, it definitely gave her, um, quality of life. Carly, do you have any other stories of people you've helped with cannabis? <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's... The, um, that's right now right. I have 256 <laughs> patients that I'm helping this month on a monthly basis. Um, 256. Yeah. Well, give us give us a couple of examples. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, we help everyone from children to adults. So we have um, a couple of kids that are in BC Children's Hospital that are leukemia patients that wouldn't be alive if they didn't have the cannabis oil. We had one child that we completely is completely leukemia free and got released last week from BC Children's Hospital. They're great about uh, letting their patients have cannabis. Yes, um, that's been my they're experience. They're just like as well. amazing. They all know me by name, and they're just they're just really amazing. They let you they let the parents treat their children with cannabis as long as obviously the doctor agrees. But a lot of them are un, in the know there, a lot more than say St. Paul's. We have a couple of of patients in St. Paul's Hospital and. Uh, basically, because two two of my patients are there, they've been labeled as drug users, and they're not allowed to have any medications at all. This, this is uh, for listeners out of the country. This is St. Paul's Hospital, Hospital in yeah. Vancouver yeah. and Children's Hospital. So there's really a difference between the two hospitals. Children's there's hospital. really a difference between every single hospital out there. It's quite okay. crazy, actually. Yeah. Now you know it's um, my experience, Carly, with the the people that I know uh, who have had children in uh, Children's Hospital 
that they're very open to cannabis oil. I can think of a number of them. It's really nice that um, they realize that. And and the thing is, like I said, for these kids or these adults that have been throwing up for, you know, weeks and weeks because they're so nauseous, all of a sudden they get relief from this oil and it's it's life changing. It happens it happens in a couple of days. It doesn't take long mm-hmm. for you to start feeling the benefits of cannabis. And that's um probably the biggest thing that i saw was a lady that came in and she had a tumor that was the size of a grapefruit hanging off of her ear and basically we had taken cannabis oil and we had used it topically as well as she has taken the oil and basically done the same protocol as um like the rick simpson protocol and Within two and a half months, the tumor was like flaking off. And after six months, it was almost completely gone. Yeah, we did uh, an interview with a fellow in Vietnam who uh, was an American who moved to Vietnam. He was uh, a Vietnam vet. And he had a similar issue. He had this tumor behind his ear, which was just absolutely enormous. And Mm -hmm. uh, he said it stunk. Yes, it does. Yeah, it's it, yeah. Ju- it just reeked. He walked into he says when I walk into a room, people could smell it. But mm-hmm. he he started using cannabis oil, put it on topically, taking it internally, and he sent us some pictures of it and you could see over uh, I guess about 3 months the this huge tumor just got smaller, smaller and smaller. And now all he has is about the size of a silver dollar. Uh, it's not the tumor; it's just a little red mark behind his ear. Mm-hmm. It's astounding. It is. It really is. Um, I had a lady that I was working with for a long time, and she has Parkinson's, and uh, she was always really hesitant of using cannabis oil because she she never liked cannabis smoking it when she was a teenager. And finally, I was over there probably about three months ago, and she was shaking so badly, and I said. I made these edibles. Please just try a brownie. Let's just see if it works. You know, we weren't going out that night. Let's just see what happens. Well, within 15 minutes, she had no tremors and she was completely still. It was the first time in probably 10 years that she hadn't shook from her Parkinson's. And now she uses cannabis every day. And like she was just dead against it. She was dead set against it and that's the thing that i really want people to know is that just because you have to take cannabis or just because you choose to take cannabis doesn't mean that you have to be a cannabis user there's lots of ways to go around it to go around the high feeling you don't have to get high off of it um especially like Corey was saying there's suppository use um there's there's lots of non-psychoactive strains and there's also the mi- other thing, mi- microdosing. You can take small Exactly. Amounts. Microdosing is great. That's what we do for a lot of patients. But the other thing that I really, really want to get out there, um, and, and this is really important to me, is that CBD oil does not cure cancer. Yes. So thank please you. don't waste your money on CBD oil because it does nothing. Okay, let's repeat if that. CBD it, does not cure cancer. Exactly. So... You can use it synergistically with your THC oil, but unless you're using it in a synergistic way, it's not going to work. Just taking CBD oil, and I don't care if you're taking a lead. I had a patient that was taking a liter of hemp oil. It's not going to do anything. Mm. It's just do your research. I mean, you're already out there looking at the Internet, finding out what what the best options are for you. Do your research. Make sure that you're not getting hustled and that you're taking oil that's, you know, insist on test results. Please insist on test results. If they don't have test results, don't take the oil. Carly, I can't tell you how many people I've lost because they thought they needed CBD. And then they come to me at the end of the road and say this CBD isn't working. CBD is wonderful. CBD is kind of the new kid on the block last three or four years with Sanjay Gupta and... uh, the weed specials and where cbd shines is with uh inflammatory conditions uh post-traumatic stress disorder seizures it's great but you need that thc component that's right if you want to kill cancer, you're not, THC. 
Exactly, Ian. You're not going to kill cancer. You're not going to shrink cancer. There's nothing to attack the cancer cells when the THC isn't there. And if you're afraid of getting high and you just don't like the feeling, either get over it or don't take it at all. Just don't waste your time and your money because the thing is, is that it's just not going to do anything, just CBD. Carly, it was wonderful to talk to you. A great story and a great ending. You got rid of your cancer and uh, you're helping people. It's fantastic. Anything you want to say in conclusion? Um, The only thing that I wanted to add is I had the um, opportunity of meeting Corey Yelland and Rick Simpson together. And Corey, you've really, really, really changed my life and helped me in so many ways, just like Rick has. And I just want you to know that I think you're amazing. Oh, and you. Gail and I just think the world of you. And I, I love you to death. I think that that there just needs to be more people like you. Well, Thanks thank a you. lot for all you do. Thanks so much, Carly. I Th- love you too. Thanks, Carly. Thanks, Ian. Take care. You too. Bye. And we thank Carly for her inspiring story. That's it. Another edition of Cannabis Health Radio. Thanks for listening, everyone. You've been listening to the Cannabis Health Radio podcast. Visit our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.